Let's just pray before I get started. Lord, there's that, uh, there's that statement that familiarity breeds contempt. And, and I think that we can become so familiar with something, we can come, become so familiar with a thing or even a relationship that we, we almost disrespect it or dishonor it. And I think sometimes when we, we study through Scripture, especially Scripture that, we've, uh, that, that we know well or stories that we know well, we just kind of breeze through it because that we, we think that we have it all down. So what I'm praying, Holy Spirit, that you do this morning as we study through the Sermon on the Mount, actually for the next few weeks, that you would pour down something anew to us, that you would give us a fresh revelation of who you are and who we are, who you are in us. And I believe that's what you want to teach us through these Beatitudes, that it's such a revolutionary teaching uh, the whole Sermon on the Mount, but, but specifically these eight Beatitudes that I'm probably not going to get through this morning, but they're so um, antithetical. They're, they're just, they, they turn our world upside down because when we read them and, and we read that we're supposed to be blessed by them and then we read how we're going to be blessed, it doesn't feel like blessing. So Lord, you're about to... Uh, to share with us about what your upside-down kingdom looks like and and the upside-down kingdom that we're a part of because we have to resist certain things in our life that cause us to steer another way. We have to fight against our flesh. We have to fight against our emotion. And we know that there's a strength within us because, Holy Spirit, you are within us to help us live out these attributes. And really, it's a state of of being that you you just want us to, to live out. And, and through these things, your kingdom will manifest. We pray about your kingdom coming. Well, this is about your kingdom coming. Your kingdom comes from within us. So help us to be about that in Jesus' name. Amen. So the irony of this, this series of messages is that we've called it practical. And if you've ever read through the Beatitudes, it doesn't feel real practical. Matter of fact, it, it feels like we cannot do those things, and, and it doesn't, those, things don't, those things don't make sense. And I don't care how long you've been walking with the Lord, the, the Beatitudes are a challenge. You know, the stuff that he says you're going to be blessed if you, you know, when you're persecuted. I mean, it, it just, it, it's just craziness. It's craziness. I, I, I don't remember the first time I read through it, but it doesn't matter. Almost every time I read through it, I, I think... This stuff is not easy. I, I don't feel blessed when I'm any of these, any of these things. But we know as believers, the longer that we're walking, walking with the Lord, that there's something within us when we, when we become these things because, because Christ, Christ is in us through the power of the Holy Spirit, then, then we actually do feel blessed. I think, I think the problem is we use this word blessing so often. It, it really has dumbed down the meaning of the word, it, it it means happy, but it doesn't mean happy in the sense of the word that that we that that, that Western culture thinks of happy. So we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about that this morning. Uh, if you want to turn your Bibles to Matthew five, and uh, we're probably only gonna make it. Well, we're gonna read one through one through eleven in a minute. I'm gonna ask you to actually stand for the reading of the word, um, just so that we can give the, the proper respect and honor to it. But I want to open with this commentary from this, this commentator that I read. It says, this is the opening move of a more drastic and fundamental reassessment of political and social affairs, applying not only to its own time, but to all future times down to our day. More still, it points to the increasing fulfillment of this world, of the promise of the human condition as such, and of the struggle against vast and daunting but insurmountable o- obstacles that such fami- fulfillment will require. You know, when Jesus first gave this sermon at the Sermon on the Mount to, to, to primarily disciples, but the crowds were there, actually not primarily to the disciples, he told his disciples to come near, but he knew the crowds were around him, so the message was, was to, to the disciples and to the, to the crowd. He knew that what he was sharing was turning everything upside down. It was speaking against the, everything in the culture, uh, not just Roman culture, but, but in the, the, the Pharisaical religious system that existed. In, the, in that culture where, where uh, religion 
And piety was on the outside. It wasn't, it, wasn't on, it wasn't on the inside. It wasn't about a change of heart. And they had, the, the Jews and these religious people had lost, they, they lost the meaning and the essence and the heart of all the commandments and what the prophets were speaking about. They, they formed their own religion. They created their own God, really. And, uh, what, and so Jesus wasn't just railing against Roman culture. He was railing against everything that existed in that time. So let's read. Uh, let's just read through these beatitudes, and we're gonna. Uh, then I'm gonna back up, and we're gonna go through each one of them at a time, one, one at a time, because they they deserve some time spent on them for us to truly a- absorb what these attributes are. And really, these are kingdom a- attributes. If you if you took if you took Jesus' whole sermon on the mount, um, you could see how it touches on everything that he taught after that, all the way through the gospels. It was. The, the, the kingdom of God, these are attributes about the kingdom, but it's, it's the theme in everything that Jesus shared in all of his messages to his disciples and the crowds. So if you can all stand, we're going to read Matthew 5, just 1 through 11. You don't have to repeat after me, but just stand and listen. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Amen. You can be seated. So, where did this take place? I was fortunate enough to be in Israel, and we spent half of our trip around the Sea of Galilee, and uh, it was called Lake Gennesaret. I want to say Gennesaret because that's how I've pronounced it in, in, in the past. It's actually called Tiberius too, isn't it? Called the Lake, Lake Tiberius. So it's, we've known it as a Sea of Galilee, but when you go there, you're thinking, this doesn't look like a sea. Uh, it looks like about the size of Aronicoid Bay. It's probably a little, a, a little bit bigger, but it, quite a bit bigger. But, it, but it's, a, it's a lake and you can see all sides from wherever you're standing on the, on the shore. So this is where Jesus actually taught the Sermon on the Mount. We actually stood where they believe the sermon, the sermon was ta- taught. We actually took a, a boat ride across the, the Sea of Galilee, and we had St. Peter's fish, which is, I think, um, tilapia, isn't it? Yeah, yeah tilapia. Um, they, they call it St. Peter's fish. But it was a wonderful experience. But we actually got to stand where this, this sermon was preached. And it's, it was actually pretty strategic because you wouldn't need a microphone even if I was speaking to about a thousand people because it's, it's surrounded by mountains and your voice just carries forever. So uh, it was a great place to preach this sermon. So it says that Jesus' disciples were there and he called his disciples close by, but they weren't, they weren't the only ones that Jesus was speaking to. There were people that were drawn in it and I'm sure there were, there were the religious, religious elite that were there, probably not many of them at the time, but rumors started to travel about who, who Jesus was. But it was primarily disciples and people that heard about Jesus. And uh, they, they saw him, they saw him get baptized not long before this, but crowds had gathered around, around him, so it was the disciples and then whoever else wanted to listen. And uh, he starts to deliver this, this message. And each one of these attributes begins with blessed. Now, again, we use this word blessed all the time, like, like bless you when you sneeze. Um, you know, bless you, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's like a salutation or, or, or saying hello to somebody, and I think it's kind of lost, lost its punch. It actually, it actually literally does mean to be happy, but not in a happy in the sense of the word that we think of happy. We think of, we think of happy as, you know, a, a feeling that we feel when we're pleased about something. This is not the type of happiness that the scripture is talk, these scriptures are talking about, because it wouldn't make sense. Happy are you if you're persecuted. That does not make sense. So it can't be talking about the happiness that's in most of our minds when we think of, when we think of happiness. 
And we know that that's a human pursuit. Um, Pascal, the great mathematician, said, all men seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. The cause of some going to war and of others avoiding it. It is the same desire in both attended with different views. The will never takes the least step but to this object. This is the motive of every action of every man, even those who hang themselves. They hang themselves because they're not happy. You know, so we know that this is, this is like a human pursuit to be happy, to avoid pain, to avoid suffering, to avoid the stuff that the Beatitudes talk about being blessed or being happy about. So obviously, we need to understand what happy means. And we're going to talk about that. Happiness is like a state of being. I don't think the type of happiness that, that this is talking about, you can't be this unless Jesus is in you. The Holy Spirit's got to be in you. Because this type of happiness is, is more like joy. It's an inner peace that you have, no matter what's going on around you, no matter the trial. And we all experience stuff. Trials, tribulation, pain, suffering, sickness, death, grief, all those things that the Beatitudes talk about. But it's saying that in all of that, you can have a sort of supernatural happiness, a supernatural joy that lifts you out of that. Now, many people never find that because they never find Jesus and they succumb to terrible things, depression, suicide. There's a joy that you can have in the Lord. And we know this, who are sons and daughters of the Most High God. We know of that joy. We know where to find that joy. And where is it? It's in Jesus. And where's Jesus? Jesus is in you. That's why the relationship is so important. That joy is there already in you. And what these Beatitudes are, are trying to explain is that they're not necessarily things that you pursue. It's letting you know that these things are already in you. You need to just be these things. And the closer that you develop a relationship with Christ, the more revelation that you get of who he can be in you, you will see yourself blessed when you go through things like this. Really, these are... They're like covenant blessings in my mind. You know, there were certain, there were certain blessings that were, that were pronounced over, over the, the people of Israel, over the Jewish people. Some were contingent on their behavior, some was not. You know, God, God just had a covenant with them and he said, this is a lasting covenant and it doesn't matter if you blow it or not, I'm going to keep it. There were other covenants that they said, if, if, if you blow it, then this is what the punishment is, is going to be. So here's your warning. So walk in my ways. And if you don't, this is what it's going to look like. You know, this, this really is, is, this is like Jesus pronouncing a covenant blessing over his people if we would learn to live this way and access what's already in us. So let's just take a look at these, these, uh, these blessed statements individually. The first one is, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Whenever I don't understand a word or a phrase in scripture, I I go deeper into scripture. I try to find other passages that talk about that specific word. I think it's important to do that specifically through the Beatitudes because you get a really good idea of what the actual Beatitude means by doing that. So I did that for you so you don't have to do it, but you can do it on your own and probably find more scriptures. Proverbs 16, 19 says, It is better to be of lowly spirit with the poor than to divide the spoil with the proud. Isaiah 66.2 says, I will look to this type of man, even to him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. So the first passage in Proverbs speaks of, it speaks of physical poverty, but it's not just speaking of just physical poverty. Obviously, if we take that pa passage in Isaiah 66, it's talking, somebody who, talking about somebody who has a contrite spirit. So someone who is poor in spirit, think about the people that surrounded Jesus. Who was drawn to Jesus? I mean, yeah, the religious elite, because they wanted to catch him, they wanted to catch him, you know, messing things up. They wanted to catch him in a lie or in deceit. They, they, couldn't find, they couldn't find that in him, so they would make false accusations about him. But generally, who were the people that were attracted to Jesus? Street people, the sick, the needy, the, the physically poor, but the spiritually poor. People who were not accepted into, 
into that religious system. They, weren't, they, 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 they couldn't even go into certain parts of the temple, even if they decided that they wanted to be a part of the, the, the Jewish tribe. There was, there was an outside court, like the Gentile court. Here we have, here we have a rabbi. Here we have, have this, this Jesus guy talking about this kingdom, and, and now he's opening up this kingdom to everyone. So the people that were, that were, that were outsiders, that were, that were shunned, and, and that, was, that was his disciples, I mean, they, they were people that were, that, most of them anyways, they were people that were shunned. They were on the outside, and Jesus was drawing them in. They were poor of spirit because they knew of their sin, of their frailty, of their imperfection. The Pharisees didn't. The religious people didn't. They thought, they thought that they arrived. They looked good on the outside, but they were corrupt on the inside, and most of them didn't even know it. So the poor in spirit were people who are well aware of their own human frailty and knew they needed something to fix them. So he was saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Not the religious elite, the people that think that they've arrived, but but you, the kingdom of heaven, is for you because you know your state. You know that you're desperate without me. That's what that passage means. You're like a beggar in the street. It's it's really an absence of pride and self-righteousness. The Pharisees were self-righteous. They were full of it. They were full of pride. They puffed themselves up and they bragged about themselves. You know, to, to, to be poor in spirit is someone who's aware of their own frailty, who's not self-righteous, who, who's not self-sufficient and self-reliant. It's someone who knows that they need Jesus. And look around you. I don't care how long you've been walking with the Lord. As you look around, we all desperately need Jesus. And we're only where we are because Jesus got us here. Amen? Amen. And as we, as we continue to go through these things, I think that you need to have that picture in your mind. You need to have that picture of Jesus because Jesus really is the definition of all these things. Jesus was poor in spirit. Think about this. The Son of God coming down as a baby, not just not an adult human being, but a baby to be taken care of these frail, imperfect human beings. Jesus, the Son of God, comes as a human being. That is poor in spirit. And he didn't come to be the sort of king that humans flatter other humans about. about. He, he, was, he was the suffering servant. He came to serve humanity, not to dictate, dictate to them and rule them. Not, not in the human sense of the word. This next blessed, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Have you ever seen a mournful, happy person? I, I haven't. It, this says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be Happy are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I have never seen a mournful, happy person. There's nothing happy about that gut-wrenching feeling that you have when you're mourning over something, the mourning over some loss. It, it doesn't have to necessarily be the loss of a human being. It could be a loss of a job, a, 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 a position of you know, half your in, investments in the, in, in the stock, stock market. That, that can produce mourning, but it doesn't produce happiness. So what's this talking about? It's talking about a happiness that transcends what you're going through. It transcends your feelings. We don't mourn as those who have no hope, is what it says in Scripture. We mourn, but we don't mourn with those who have hope. So while we're going through that mourning phase, while we're, while we're experiencing mourning, we're experiencing sadness, we're experiencing loss, we're never brought to such a low place that it brings deep depression and we lose hope. We don't mourn with those that don't have hope because we have hope. We have an eternal hope, but we have a hope in, in the presence that, that is available to us now that can lift us out of that deep mourning. Luke seven thirty six through 40 talks about the woman who was in mourning who wept at Jesus' feet, and she was comforted by Jesus. Luke, Luke 19 talks about how Jesus was weeping over the future destru- destruction of the temple. Jesus experienced legitimate mourning and sadness over people's sin. Yet, yet Jesus said, be happy are those who mourn because they will be comforted. 
by the Holy Spirit that's within them. I mean, if you're not, if you don't understand what that type of mourning is, then you won't be comforted and you can't be happy. The, the, this type of mourning is the same mourning that everybody else feels, but it doesn't do the same thing to us that it does the rest of the world. It also keeps your heart soft and sensitive to the Holy Spirit. This next beatitude is, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What do you think of when you hear that word meek? What's that? Humble. You ever, you ever heard that expression, meek as a mouse? You've never heard that expression? I'm the only one that's heard that expression? Well, meekness in Scripture is not this idea of meekness that people have in the world. People think of people who are meek as people who are cowards, who don't speak their mind, who hide. Maybe they're afraid. This is not the sort of meek that, that, that the Lord is talking about, and, and the, those types of meek people can't, won't inherit the earth anyhow. Meek does not mean weak. The biblical definition of meekness is actually contained strength. I mean, if you picture Jesus, Jesus could have called down the fires from heaven to consume anybody he wanted them to consume, but he didn't. Jesus is that per- perfect picture of meekness. He had that power within him, but the power was contained because he only did what the Father told him to do. He's that perfect picture of weakness. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 says, He invited his followers with these words, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. What's this whole diet, idea of inheriting the earth? It certainly wasn't talking about inheriting Israel. That may have be what Judas wanted, but that's not what this, this passage, this, this beatitude meant. It didn't mean inheriting the earth in, in the sense of inheriting some sort of political system or some sort of human, human rule. Although it is talking literally of an earth, the, the present earth, and also the future new heavens and the new earth, because those that are, have these attributes had the Holy Spirit contained within them, will inherit the earth. We, it says that, that in the new heavens and the earth, we will be ruling with him. His sons, sons and daughters will be ruling with him. So it was a future, it was a future hope, but it was also something that was supposed to be presently felt. There was a kingdom that he wanted to establish in the hearts of men, that people would feel like, I belong to this family. I belong to this kingdom. It was a kingdom without walls. It was a kingdom without borders. It was a kingdom that was within the hearts of every believer. You know, we have a pretty large family, more than this building can contain. There are believers all over the world. That is part of the kingdom of God. It's about people in the rule of God in our lives. This next beatitude is in chapter 6. It said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. A couple passages of scripture, one in Matthew 4, 4. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. John 6, 35 says, I am the bread of life, and if a man thirst, let him come to me and drink. It's a spiritual hunger for righteousness. And it's interesting, if you you break this word down in, in the Greek in scripture, it actually means pursuing justice also. So righteousness is tied to justice. It's a desire for justice for yourself and for others, but it's a godly type of justice. It's not, it's not like the justice that, that a lot of folks are screaming about now, which really is about revenge and re- re- retaliation or getting what I am owed. It's about biblical, biblical justice, which may include those things, but it always includes restoration. God's biblical justice always has restoration in mind. There are consequences for actions, there are consequences for sin, but biblical justice is always about restoring the individuals. That's what biblical justice is. So this passage is also speaking of biblical justice. And ultimate justice comes when both parties are submitted to the Lord. That should always be our goal. I am fine with us pursuing justice in the world and even in the legal system. But our mind, a believer's mind, always has to be the idea 
with, with rest, we, we are about restoring the individual, even the perpetrator, the victim and the perpetrator. That is biblical justice. Verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Matthew 7, 2, if you do not forgive men your trespasses, Kyle was touching on this in communion, if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Matthew 6, 15, so if you want to obtain mercy from God, we must be merciful ourselves. I'm not seeing a whole lot of mercy out there today. <laughs> I see a lot of pointing fingers and pointing, pointing fingers at, at, at things that people do wrong or, or don't do wrong but are blamed for doing, doing wrong. I don't see mercy out there in culture. And the church has to be about mercy. The church has to be about forgiveness. The focus in this beatitude is on the heart and the motivation behind a thing. And this was certainly not the, fo- the, the focus of the religious elite. It's really about really experiencing God. If you, if you know that you are forgiven and you are well aware that you need to be forgiven, then you have no trouble forgiving even people that don't deserve your forgiveness. It's always our job to forgive. It's God's job to restore. It's our job to forgive even when that person doesn't want your forgiveness. Biblical forgiveness is releasing that person of the... And you have to have this in your mind. I forgive you, even though you don't recognize it or realize it, but I forgive you, I release you, and you let God deal with them. Otherwise, you're held hostage with them. Amen? Amen? Verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Given the division and very destructive us versus them mentality of our modern American culture, the blessing of the true peacemakers is perhaps more important than ever. Leaders have destroyed civility of late and worked to incessantly disseminate hate, division, and even promote violence on many levels. It is time for Christianity to rise above the hate and the anger and breathe the spirit of peace. There is a difference between being a peacemaker and a peacekeeper. What does this passage say? Blessed are the peacemakers. What's the difference between a peacemaker and a peacekeeper? What's that? Initiating. Initiating, exactly. But also, being someone who's a peacemaker will make peace at any cost. Even, even if something needs to be rectified, something resolved, they, they won't confront it because they just want everybody to be happy. They want everybody, everybody to be at peace. The, the, the peace. the peace keeper is someone that will ignore injustice. The peacemaker won't in, ignore justice, but will, but will also bring in that, that restoration peace. You know, there's a difference between being a peacemaker and a peacekeeper. And he calls us to be peacemakers. And he says, those who are peacemakers, they will be called children of God. There's this author that I was reading. She said, if most of us were honest with ourselves, we know that there are many ways in which our hearts are not at peace. We are wounded, insecure, resentful, and lonely. And this restlessness within us causes us, causes us to anxiously defend our actions and opinions to control others, and to seek after their love and praise at all costs. It causes you to be a man-pleaser is what it does. Romans 12, 18, 12, 18 says, If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all people. If you don't have to create friction by your comment, by your defending yourself, this scripture says, then don't. Be, be a peace maker. I mean, look at all the accusations that were thrown at Jesus, and he never really defended himself. And he had a right to. He was the only human being that ever had been sinless. All his accusations that were against him were false accusations. He had every right to defend himself, but he never defended himself. He allowed God to defend him. 
Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. And then the last blessed is in verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Happy are those that are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The second century, by the second century, it was a capital offense to be a Christian. Tertullian, around the year 200, writes this, You put Christians on crosses and stakes. We are cast to the wild beasts. We are burned in flames. We are condemned to the mines. We are banished to the islands. They torture, put to death, and banish the worshipers of the Most High God. That is the righteous. Yet those who hate us so vehemently are unable to give a reason for their hatred. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Happy are those that are persecuted. You should expect persecution. You should expect that offenses are going to come your way. You should not be surprised by it because when you're not surprised by it, you're prepared to respond the way that you should respond. I mean, many of you have read through the Fox's Book of Martyrs of all those who would never deny Jesus, never denied their faith in the midst of persecution, and not just persecution, but death and martyrdom. That sort of supernatural ability, I know what you're thinking, I could never do those things. I could, you know, what's, what's the big deal? I'll, I'll just say that I don't believe in Jesus and I can, I can save my life. But if you have respect and honor for the person that you, would, that you serve, the God that you serve, you would never, you would never say that you, you, you deny him. You would never say that you didn't believe in him. And you have the ability to have that sort of courage. That is within you. And that is what that happiness and that joy that joy brings. You're so joyful, you're so full of the Lord, no matter what the outward experience, God can sustain you. The Holy Spirit can sustain you. The kingdom of heaven is their reward. It's the domain of the Lord, the realm of which his will, his will is obeyed. The kingdom is on earth and in heaven. It is past, present, and future, and it is within you. It was within Jesus Jesus is within us, so the kingdom is within us and wherever we go. The the Beatitudes express the idea that peace comes from peacemakers who are characterized by their poverty of spirit, their ability to mourn for the world, their lack of attachments or clinging to personal rights, their hunger for the healing of the world, their extreme mercy extended even towards their worst enemies in the purity of heart. Peacemakers, according to Christ, are the instruments who bring peace to the world because they exemplify exemplify these characteristics. Change comes from the inside and moves towards the external. Peacemakers are persecuted because they present a challenge to authority which compels from the outside but cannot penetrate the interior. That is the difference between a believer. We are changed from the inside out. And we have to believe that that is the best way to change a person from the inside out. We've, I've tried this, to clean people up on the outside. You just need to stop saying that. You need to you discontinue this behavior or stop wearing that or stop watching that. And generally, it fails. If you could just pray that Jesus begins to transform their hearts and their minds from the inside, that's the best way to transform a person. The best thing you could do to people is pray for them, not preach to them. By being an example to them, not preaching to them, not telling them what to do, not manipulating, not making them feel guilty for their sin, but by being an example and praying for them, that Jesus would give them a revelation of who he is in them. And then I'm just going to conclude with these two passages in 13 and 14. It says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, How can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. 
In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That, if you demonstrate and exude these beatitudes, you can be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. These attributes lived out don't, eat, don't just bring transformation in you. They will bring transforma- transformation in your environment, the people around you, in your workplace, at school. God wants to reveal these attributes in you. They are already in you. They're not, they're not things that you have to run after and pursue. You have to actively engage your will. I'm going to allow these things to manifest themselves, but they are already in you. And they can rule your life instead of letting your emotions and your mind rule your life. Amen? Lord, these are radical statements. And to the natural mind, we want to resist it. We don't, want, we don't even want to believe that, that it can be so in us. But if it's in your word and we're your son or you're, we're your daughter, then, then we can be these things with the power power of your Holy Spirit that's in us. So Holy Spirit, I pray that you would transform us, that that you would give us a revelation of who we are in you. I was thinking of this as we were singing these, these worship songs. We need a deeper revelation and awareness of your presence in our lives, but your presence never leaves us. It's always there. But it's a recognition and a realization that you are there. And that there's a great power available that's within us to be all that you said that we can be. Everything that leads to life and godliness has already been provided for us on the cross. And being filled with your spirit. So Lord, I pray that we as a people would be submitted to that work that you want to do within us so that we can display these attributes that, that can be confusing to the world because they're expecting retaliation. They're expecting what they would give. But Lord, we're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be Christ-like. And Lord, I, would pr- I just pray that we, we would have the courage and the resolve to be like you, to act like you, and to talk like you. In Jesus' name, amen.